See, I learned how to do howdy. <laughs> this, is not, this is not my inaugural howdy. I, I admit to howdying before. Um, well, thanks for showing up um, for a slightly delayed lecture from uh, midday. Um, we have Steve Trumbull here from Baylor University. Steve is continuing as a third speaker on our animal conservation series. And uh, we have, this is our last of those speakers for this semester, and we'll have another two, I think, or three in the fall semester. So um, watch out for those. So Steve comes to us from just up the road in Baylor. Um, he's been there since 2008. Before that, um, he was at uh, University of Michigan for a little while, and then at um, UT Southwestern uh, Medical School. Um, for a postdoc, and before that he did a postdoc in um, Seattle on marine mammals with the, with the National Marine Fisheries. And prior to that, uh, he had the honor of being a, having me on his committee at <laughs> University of Alaska in Fairbanks, um, which has been a long time ago. He still hasn't forgiven me. <laughs> he has issues. <laughs> We're working through them. <laughs> um, so Steve's actually spent most of his career as a comparative physiologist. Um, he follows in the tradition of August Crow, where um, somewhere out there, there's an animal that has a mechanism that will help you understand the system. And his chosen systems are marine mammals. And uh, he started his master's degree in California working on behavior of uh, uh, harbor seals. Um, harbor seals are very twitchy in California, and so they're actually difficult to study. But he's gone on to study some other things in very difficult places. Uh, Weddell seals off the sea ice. Um, yesterday we were talking about uh, his project that is tentatively funded by NSF on leopard seals. Not many people know much about leopard seals, and not many people have actually been very close to a leopard seal. Um, 15 foot long, looks like a snake. So very interesting animals. Um, Steve's work has involved not only remote places, but some very, very interesting animals in labs and lab situations. He has projects on fish and has been working on things as even as mundane as rats to develop certain ideas that he's then gone out and applied for diving physiology of things like elephant seals. So without much further ado, Steve Tremble. Thanks, Barry. I don't know if I can dim this a bit. Is that fine? Excellent. <clears throat> I appreciate everybody for showing up. Um, going to try to, you know, yeah. Yeah, earwax, let's get it over with, right? So that's earwax or cerumen. Uh, this is an earplug, or actually it's half of a plug. Um, that's probably about six inches long or so. Um, and whales do have them, they have earplugs. They do um, deposit earwax, um, kind of in the same fashion that we do. And so what I'm gonna to talk to you today about is some data that's coming out of my lab. Um, show you probably a couple neat graphs that we just sort of, um, uh, some data we recently developed, along with some stuff that we're just now getting uh, from the uh, earplugs. And really interesting with this is we're kind of um, trying everything we can since it's, uh, these samples are pretty rare um, and or uh, the sample mass is not uh, great, and so we get to uh, kind of play around with various methods also. This all started probably oh, 2010 when I was uh, going for coffee with one of my colleagues at Baylor, uh, Sasha Yusenko, and we were actually walking across campus and we were going to Starbucks, you know, midday type thing, and we were chatting about how do you age a whale. And Sasha's background is uh, kind of analytical chemistry, and he's done a lot of work in Alaska on sediment cores. And we were chatting about whales, and I said, oh yeah, there's earplugs, there's various ways to age a whale. And he said, wow, that's crazy, earplugs. And he said, yeah, it's kind of like a sediment core. And we kind of looked at each other, and we were like, well, wait a minute, you know, if 
they're, maybe they have something in them. So I contacted a colleague of mine, Smithsonian. He sent us a plug uh, from 1969 and about 18 months of development. Um, uh, and you know, mass specs really don't like wax, um, as you might figure. So it took a lot of kind of method development and a lot of time and effort. Uh, but we finally figured out a method uh, that uh, seemed to work. And um, I can show you some of those data um, right now. I don't have a little clicker, so I have to walk back here every time. So some basic facts for mysticetes, and these are baleen whales. There's about 15 species. Uh, they're ubiquitous around the globe, very uh, migratory. Um, and because of that, uh, they're referred to as sentinels of the ocean, right? I kind of call them lipophiles, right? They have a huge amount of lipid, and this lipid kind of absorbs things from uh, uh, the water um, and the air and their food and everything else. Uh, very long lived uh, from 30 years, and there's a new paper that came out, in, you know, relatively new, 2015, uh, showing that uh, bowheads can live uh, upwards of 200 years uh, based on some of their uh, genetic and anecdotal information. Um, everybody knows that uh, whaling was a big deal in the 19th, late 19th, mid 19th, uh, 20th century. And uh, here's a bowhead here, a right whale looks like, and guys getting their little uh, selfies done with it, like how proud. This is uh, back from 1800 Japanese drawing uh, showing the uh, netting of whales in some sort of a cove. And this just shows, you won't be able to see the numbers. Uh, this is for blue whale populations um, have gone down somewhere, they estimate about 90 to 95%, and about 2.9 million uh, whales killed uh, in the 20th century. Um, and these data uh, from here uh, came out in a paper recently, uh, 2015 paper by Roca et al. Um, where they actually went back and they got Soviet um, uh, records and, and all around the world and actually got uh, year by year uh, whale takes um, from northern and southern hemisphere. That uh, was quite amazing uh, data set that they have. Right. So whales do have uh, earplugs, they do have ears, and this is kind of the opening of the canal right here. That's a, a blue whale, neat picture there. Um, obviously, they don't have the pinna like we do. Um, and the earplug uh, is not exposed uh, to the external environment. It's way uh, buried into the skull. I'll show you a little picture of that here. Right. Kind of a model. This was at the London Museum of Natural History. This is the actual tympanic boa. Uh, looks like of a fin whale. And this is called the glove finger. It's kind of the tympanic membrane, uh, ear canal, auditory meatus. And here's the ear plug that forms off the tip of the, the uh, glove finger here. Doesn't really look like this in this pretty in real life, um, and it's very difficult to extract. Right? Here's where you see it on this neat little diagram here by Darlene Ketton from Woods Hole, showing the tympanic boa here, and you have the uh, ear plug. It has to go through several feet of blubber um, tissue and whatnot. That's why I will not have any exposure to the external environment. This is an earplug here. Here's a glove finger. This is a very young animal. Uh, here's the tympanic boa here. This is from a two-year-old. Right? <clears throat> I've seen plugs from a couple centimeters up to 53 centimeters. So, uh, and very odd, um, 53 centimeter chunk of earwax. Uh, pretty interesting. Couple pounds, right? Uh, 1910, uh, Lilly described earplugs uh, in a paper. He was actually doing, I don't even think he was a scientist, he was just doing some observations at an uh, outpost in Norway, and uh, he described this in his uh, neat little paper. The cerumen or the earwax is ger generated continuously through life, made up of about half and half keratin and lipid. And I'll lay down these uh, really interesting, um, you see here, this shows uh, light and dark layers. It's kind of hard to see from where you're sitting. Um, but this is how we age, and we cut the plug and bisect it in half and polish it down and actually age the plug. Um, and they've been doing this for 100 years. I mean, this isn't anything new. This isn't rocket science here. It's just counting the lines. And 
from the 1950s and 60s was really big um, that uh, researchers were validating how to age a whale using earplugs. Um, and it wasn't until we came along a few years ago and decided that uh, we can do chemical analysis uh, with these layers and uh, try to uh, figure out what's going on and reconstruct these lifetime profiles uh, for uh, any individual animal. Here's the, uh, the glove finger here, which you'll see here cut in half. And here's the uh, earwax uh, or the cerumen being generated off the tip of this. Um, some evidence that sperm whales have them. Um, we haven't found them yet, uh, but according to a few people, they've uh, seen them and or uh, archived them, but again, uh, we can't locate them, even when they say they know where they are. So we're still kind of out on that one. We put a paper out, 2013, uh, PNAS, showing that this actually worked, um, and some subsequent methodology papers uh, using selective pressurized liquid extraction um, techniques and uh, dual mass spec work, uh, looking at uh, everything from hormones to pesticides. Really interesting kind of side note, when the first plug that we got, um, 1969, uh, we looked for a suite of pesticides, and we found um, some DDT, DDE, um, and some of the kind of what you'd expect, and no flame retardants. And then uh, in the 2000s, when we started uh, getting samples from uh, newer uh, carcasses, um, we find just rife with flame retardants and PBDEs. So uh, it was really neat, because you can actually see when these chemicals come on board and when they leave, um, things like that. Uh, so it's really interesting. So we think we had a pretty good method here uh, in which to kind of pursue this. Uh, we were pretty excited about it. <clears throat> and for this particular project, uh, we were just trying to get 20 plugs um, to look at uh, our cortisol or stress profiles along with some other profiles and uh, determine maybe some sort of relationship between the stress or cortisol and possible stressors um, uh, in the environment uh, or any other thing, sea surface temperature, things like that. And this is my uh, grad student working on earplugs, uh, Danny Crane, and this is Farzane uh, Mazzoni, and she's uh, helping out here. And very tedious, um, a lot of work. We had 20 earplugs, turned out to be a little over 1,109 lamina. And to put that in perspective, you know, each one of these layers is probably six months, right? And that'd be like for, from 1869, because we dated the 1909 plug back 40 years, till 2016, if you went out every six months and found 20 of the same animals and took a blubber sample, right? Absolutely, if you think of it that way, it cost a fortune and then some, and it's just not gonna happen, right? Because first of all, you have to find them and, and whatnot. So, and we looked at uh, 20 species, bluefin, humpback, and minke. Um, so, why stress? Why do we care about stress? Navy was really interested uh, because there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, issues between kind of the whaling, uh, not the whaling folks who are doing the whaling, but the uh, whale advocates. Uh, conservation-minded uh, folks uh, and the Navy with their sonar and uh, some other noise issues uh, going on in the ocean. So stress can be defined as this biological response uh, listed when the individual perceives a threat to its homeostasis. It's conserved mammalian response. Uh, it can be negative, uh, chronic for long term. Uh, it could be a positive thing. Doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing if it's short term. Um, we see this in like distress uh, during certain uh, intrinsic and extrinsic factors, right? Um, stressors, anything from the external environment uh, could elicit this response, and we could actually see this uh, in the animal. This is nothing new. Um, looking at the HPA axis here, um, you know, people have used fecal glucocorticoids, uh, hair, uh, feathers. Uh, blubber, um, all sorts of neat uh, tissues or matrices for uh, uh, counting this. So 
Why measure it? Well, I kind of already told you, but this is um, some environmental or anthropogenic activity can elicit this response. And the interesting thing about this is we can compare within the individual. So we can get these lifetime profiles and see what is going on, what's the profile look like, what's the trend look like, and why is it going up or down or not moving, um, and what um, maybe, uh, you know, does pregnancy elicit a stress response and things like that. <clears throat> uh, it also provides information on the state of the environment. Since these are sentinels or very lipophilic or lipophiles, they can kind of absorb what's going on around them. And this very complex diagram here just shows you <clears throat> that, you know, I'm not going to get to everything, obviously, but you know, there's climate change, environmental changes, uh, ecological changes, and it sort of ends up with some negative association uh, with stress, whether it be thermal or uh, uh, anything else. Um, and I just show you this, meaning that I want to show the complexity of uh, what we're doing or what we're trying to do. And we're just kind of literally like touching the surface of this now. So we quantify <coughs> this in wildlife various ways. Uh, we used to do, <coughs> I don't know what happened to my picture here, something happened to it. Um, heart rate, and we'd see this in like seals uh, pre, you know, like post capture, prior to capture myopathy or something like that, some sort of a stressor event with heart rate. Um, what we're really interested in is the neuroendocrine uh, response. We can actually see the cortisol or glucocorticoid response. Their condition indices, cell function, hydration state, MBD test um, for immune system function. And now there's stuff like telomere length, which <clears throat> they're doing with humans and parrots, actually gray parrots. Um, let's see if this little picture shows up. Nope, it doesn't. Anyway, so that's what we're interested in. This is how we're trying to uh, kind of uh, move in the direction of being able to <clears throat> understand uh, at least uh, some stress event that's happened to these animals. And there's some really good work going on with uh, collecting feces or blubber or blow um, and marine mammals anyway, and probably a lot more going on in uh, birds, whatnot, with feathers and, and wildlife with hair. <clears throat> so really difficult to, you know, even doing this, right, where you're tracking an animal and then re doing recaptures, kind of a longitudinal sampling uh, design is really difficult, time consuming, uh, you know, costly, you know, especially for marine mammals, we have ship time, and this is an animal here, and this guy's shooting a biopsy, getting a nice blubber biopsy here from this animal. To actually have to recapture or recite this animal and then resample it is a, a pretty slim uh, at best that it's going to work. Uh, so it's not really going to help. Kind of the beautiful thing about some of the stuff that we're doing with uh, baleen and earplugs uh, is it kind of gives us this uh, longitudinal database that we can kind of use. <clears throat> some studies, oh, what happened here? Oh, okay. There's been a couple studies, and this is actually Sasha Yusenko. We're doing some uh, baleen uh, work in London. <clears throat> um, have found glucocorticoids in some really neat comparative studies uh, for whales. And there's this neat paper that came out in 2011 uh, showing that this was a kind of a pre and post 9-11 event when they stopped the shipping um, off the coast, um, uh, east coast there. We see a, a drop in the stress response uh, for the whales. So this gave us some insight that, yes, they do stress out and they can actually recover from this in a fairly uh, short order. Um, they obviously weren't collecting a ton of samples, but they got enough from four or five years here. Um, and they see this really interesting uh, correlation with the lack of uh, noise or shipping in that area. Like I said, more studies are coming online here with some feces and blubber and the respiration or the blow. Um, they're even using drones now to fly through the blow of, of whales uh, and collect the uh, uh, steroid uh, response from that. Uh, the French has actually, actually been doing this. Uh, pretty interesting to watch that. Um, it's difficult to, even though you got these really neat samples, 
you know, from blubber or blow or whatever, to find a baseline. And I've heard people, even while I've been here, talk about, you know, well, you know, we got to go out and collect this, and we got to collect this many of this to try to try to get some sort of a baseline response. It's not that easy. Um, it's actually very difficult. And um, with this, we can actually go back to when the animal was born, right? So you have a birth to death um, thing, and so you're going to get that baseline. Uh, response, and then you can calculate from there uh, what the maybe percent change is uh, through time. <clears throat> and this just shows uh, kind of what we get. Um, here's an earplug here, and this is kind of our this is cortisol concentration in nanograms per gram. And we have on this we have a kind of a double x-axis here, and this is age from zero to 34, and this is date. Uh, 1929 or 24, or so up to 19, what's that, uh, 60 something, right? So we get these really interesting data sets, right? I mean, this is an animal's birth to death, um, and it's kind of fun to play with and kind of figure out what's going on here. Um, as you can see, these um, it takes a long time to get that. You know, that's my grad students; they, they hate me. <clears throat> this is a. Uh, uh, just kind of a, a little uh, graph that shows some kind of representative uh, 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 cortisol concentrations for fin whale, humpback, and blue whale, um, showing how this, and the difference between the blue and the black line is just the blue line is a kind of a percent baseline change from uh, the, um, minimum baseline um, from that baseline, and then this is just absolute concentration in the black, right? See some really interesting spikes and peaks. Um, you know, it's probably difficult to uh, kind of figure out what those are in some cases. Um, but you see upward trends in some animals, uh, downward in the other, and this kind of blue whale here is kind of flat line. Uh, not much change over life, although you see some really nice um, responses. Probably has something to do with migration, feeding, and fasting. Um, we were trying to figure out if we could come up with some measure of ocean productivity, and we're still working on that, even though we do have some stable isotope information. Um, we, we haven't correlated that with this at this time yet, but we're looking for like astaxanthin or some sort of a marker that might uh, give us some indication of like krill, for instance, right, or uh, feeding. Um, that didn't really work, so we're still trying to uh, work on that. But anyway, uh, regardless, uh, interesting that, you know, again, this animal is 46 years old. It goes from 1955 to 2000, right? So we're getting like these great data sets. <clears throat> Boring chart here. It just shows a bunch of numbers from the whales that we did. Timeline of various species of animals we have collected. Uh, just the basic stuff. I'm not going to go into this too much. Uh, the interesting thing here is we have a 147-year time series. If you connect all the dots here of reconstructed cortisol profiles, uh, mean age based on the land of the counts is about 27 years old uh, for all these whales. <clears throat> and this graph here shows this is cortisol and this is age and this is kind of cortisol by age for all the animals pooled together, showing that the males have a, a, a significantly different slope than the females. Um, we have more female samples that are actually older, um, but kind of diverges around the 20s somewhere. And um, even this is not known. And this right here is probably indicative of maybe sexual maturity because um, this kind of fits in with what uh, we know uh, from other studies and anecdotally that um, animals start to reach sexual maturity about 10 years old um, in these species. Even something as simple as this, I mean, you know, we graph it out like, ah, that's great, right? But we don't even know this for a lot of uh, baleen whale species. Just saying that males are potentially have a greater stress response or something is stressing them out uh, <clears throat> more than females was kind of unknown. All right, various stressors.
got your intrinsic and extrinsic. Um, and we can look at some of this stuff. We can look at pregnancy rates, and we can look at migration through isotopes, pollutants we're doing, maybe some ship and noise interaction, perceived threats. Um, uh, we haven't got to the disease. I've uh, done a little bit with temperature. Um, I can't show you those data yet because they didn't really come out like I thought I was going to for this talk. My graphs kind of messed up on me. But um, this is a uh, new uh, National Academy of Sciences uh, came out in 2016. And so we're, I stick that up there. So here's what we show for like pregnancy, calving events, calving intervals uh, type thing. And this is uh, percent change of progesterone uh, from I think the time before that. And the red dots here indicate uh, elevated progesterone. You see this nice little you know, kind of periodicity. Um, and these arrows uh, are um, field observations that uh, verify either calf or no calf. And actually, our data matches with the field observations for this particular two animals 100% um, with calf and no calf. So it seemed to work. Um, we were really excited about this. Uh, my students working on this. So just getting pregnancy intervals for a large migratory baleen whale is not going to happen unless you do something like this. All right. Um, and uh, we've gone on to. Uh, take these data and look at them uh, from <clears throat> what's been in the literature. Got a question, Perry? Yeah. Oh. And so here's uh, stuff from the literature. This is pregnancy interval. Uh, no, no, this is from our wax, and here's from the literature. And we're pretty much spot on uh, for most of it. Uh, the Mickey whale and the bowhead were a little high, and this is probably because we have small sample sizes and we're still kind of working through this. Um, but either that or if we're right, uh, this would change kind of the, um, uh, some of the ecology uh, parameters for these, uh, for these animals. Uh, but again, most of our sample size are uh, in these three uh, species here. But very nice, kind of validates uh, kind of what we're finding. See a little bit of an uh, increase in stress or cortisol. Um, six months after um, these kind of peak progesterone periods. So there appears to be uh, some uh, stress associated with this. Um, really difficult to kind of uh, ferret this out uh, since we are only getting really six month means and uh, it's, uh, the resolution is not as great uh, as um, you'd like for that type of analysis. Um, baleen, uh, we can get better resolution. Uh, when we do the baleen, and actually uh, maybe in terms of months, or even less, however, um, you're kind of getting a time span of, it, it'll max out at about 10 years. And we don't really know what 10 years because the baleen erodes uh, through time while it's still growing. <clears throat> All right, so. This really neat paper that came out uh, by Roca and Phil Clapham and his wife um, with all of the whaling data uh, from the 20th century. And it's really interesting. I was actually looking for, because we do a lot of work with the Navy, and I was kind of looking for uh, um, sound information. Can I find anything with, has anything to do with like ocean sound levels? And I contacted this, uh, these people at NOAA and some other agencies, and they have some data, but it's kind of sketchy at best, and they do a lot of modeling. And I was like, oh. And I kind of ran across this paper, <clears throat> and I was like, oh, this is pretty fascinating. Let's just see what happens if I, if I look at this, right? If I kind of plot this out with some of our data. <clears throat> and this is just a graph that they put in the paper showing the various species. And these are whale, uh, whales killed um, through the years. Right? I think this is 20th century. Um, <clears throat> when I was up at the Smithsonian last, I was hanging out with Jim Mead, who's uh, he's an emeritus there at the Smithsonian. And he's like, oh, meet me at 8.30 in the morning, tomorrow morning. And he took me in this room, and he pulls out like stacks and stacks of old black and white whaling photos. And I was just like, 
copy them as fast as I could. He goes, oh, go ahead and take them if you want. I was like, I don't want to take them. You know? So I'll never give them back to you. <clears throat> so what we see here is cortisol um, from percent baseline for the, from the 1869 or 1870 all the way to the 2016. <clears throat> Uh, showing this really interesting pattern. And if, when I overlay the 20th century whaling uh, onto this, and this is whaling counts or whaling deaths um, on this axis here from zero to 50,000, you see a really nice sort of right, fit. And when I do the regression on this, <clears throat> here's what we get. <clears throat> from the 1960s of being the highest uh, down in the 80s and 90s, um, uh, being the lowest, um, a 0.8. I was like blown away when I saw this. I was uh, pretty excited. Um, nice correlation with uh, whaling. And then you have to start to kind of t ask yourself, now, what is it, I mean, about the whaling? Was it? Uh, the fact that they're being chased, where they're communicating each other long distances, which we know they do. There's actually this kind of zone in the ocean, it's called SOFAR, um, where they go down between six and 1,200 meters. Uh, this is the kind of the hypothesis that whales go down in the zone and they'll actually, they'll actually communicate over thousands of kilometers right, through this kind of zone in the ocean. So, Regardless of like thing, this was this kind of was neat, and I saw this going. Oh, this is kind of interesting. We have uh, kind of increase over predicted uh, here in the 1940s, even though the whaling numbers were low, cortisol was high. Uh, you can pretty much guess what that probably was. <clears throat> All right, we take that out. Uh, the 1940s out of there, and we have a really nice uh, 0.9 fit, uh, which is pretty nut nuts. Um, so with the 40s, is a 41% increase over baseline cortisol during the 40s. And, you know, I just looked online. I was like, you know, World War II, uh, from 40 to 45, uh, there's already 55,000 ships um, kind of roaming around the ocean at various times with, you know, submarines not included and planes and things like that. So lots and lots of noise. So it gives us some evidence that um, in this, uh, 1940 zone, World War II zone. Um, this was a huge stressor, probably no big surprise, but this is kind of the first uh, evidence we see that um, whaling and uh, World War II uh, had some uh, stress impact um, on. Now, let me just kind of like get away from that for a second and talk about some of the additional uh, earplug data that we're uh, getting out of these plugs. So we're doing hormones, and then the stress hormones, progesterone, testosterone, aldosterone, thyroid hormones. Um, and we're also doing contaminants, and we have over 60 plus uh, uh, organic pollutants and things that we're looking at, PCBs, the DDTE, PBDEs, and then all these metals here, and there's about 58 of them I think we've done. Uh, kind of concentrating on mercury and methylmercury, uh, we actually think um, there's a good chance that we can use mercury or methylmercury um, as a kind of a uh, cutoff for when uh, the female gives birth. Um, there's going to be a change in this uh, uh, mercury, methylmercury um, when, when the animal starts feeding from the mom. So we're kind of looking at that. We're doing some stabilized top analysis and some chiral analysis, which that's Sasha's stuff. So don't ask me about that. He tried to explain it to me, and I fell asleep. <clears throat> it was very boring. Another interesting thing, this is from, uh, this is our uh, persistent organic pollutants concentration. Um, and this is, uh, this is the sum for this particular animal. Um, like if we just add up the lamina, um, you see these really nice increases, which you would probably expect. For this animal, it's a 32 or so year old animal, and here's, a, here's the same animal uh, from the, a, a similar animal from the Atlantic and the Pacific. The interesting thing here is the difference in the slope, right? Kind of an order of magnitude and difference here. Sometimes we see two orders of magnitude. <clears throat> and 
this led us to think, wow, you know, Pacific Ocean has probably some increase in contaminant, accumulated contaminant load that's making it to the food chain to the whale, right? Not a big surprise, but really interesting to see this. And we see this in every plug we've done, right? Whether it's Pacific, they have a higher slope um, versus the Atlantic, right? And this is just another way that we can probably help identify at least the region um, from one of these animals <clears throat> where they're been harvested. And this is important because um, the Smithsonian has a thousand earplugs, right? And probably half of them are uh, not identified to a, an animal. We can do some kind of interesting tricks to figure out what type of animal it came from. And now we think we can like figure out what region it came from. Um, so they have about 450 plugs that are ID'd to a specific animal. Very interesting in itself because when you're going through the Smithsonian and you get this stuff from the 50s and 60s and 70s from the whaling era and um, these plugs were literally taken out of the whale, wrapped in a hotel napkin with a number on it and shoved in a mason jar and with a uh, lid on it, right? Wasn't very high tech. They, but the nice thing is the Smithsonian kept them for all these years and now um, uh, we're getting some really good information out of them. So anyway, the slope kind of shows rate of accumulation um, and it shows that these uh, distinct regional slopes have a potential bottom-up uh, contamination differences. <clears throat> Some more isotope stuff that we're doing. Um, we can actually, these green or fin whales, right? And this, these are humpbacks and blues and uh, minke whales. And it kind of shows that um, based on the isotopic signature, we're getting some really nice, probably subpopulation uh, information about some of these species. Um, we're still kind of picking our way through the isotope data because it's, uh, it's not simple. And what I mean by that is we get these really neat, uh, these are lifetime uh, isotopic signatures for species um, from zero age to uh, the oldest age is 60 something, I think, 65 or so. And so we're seeing these really interesting things. When you break it down <clears throat> into kind of individual animals, you'll see some uh, really nice uh, carbon nitrogen signatures that probably integrate, probably indicate some migration uh, patterns here. Um, so we're kind of working our way through this and uh, um, always up for any sort of criticism or advice if you have any on the isotope, isotope stuff because um, we're, we're kind of uh, uh, trying to make this story um, uh, at least give it something. All right, <clears throat> All right. metals, um, we've looked at, like I said, mercury and methylmercury and this is just showing you some profiles. Here's iron, phosphorus, uh, mercury and methylmercury and, and mercury. Oh, this is methylmercury and mercury. And this has given us some, you know, I mean, these are inside the whale. I mean, could this be some uh, nutrient load uh, issue? Could it be an uh, indicator of ocean productivity? Um, we don't know yet. Uh, we're still kind of um, coming up with uh, ways to look at this as well. Um, this is just showing the burden here as it goes up through time. <clears throat> We're also doing some uh, DNA. Uh, we've uh, been able to isolate DNA from uh, one of the plugs that we've tried. And we're pretty excited about this. I have a student working on uh, looking at species or stock assignment uh, and also some DNA methylation for some epigenetic stuff. And if this works, this is gonna be great because then we can have like, you know, early, mid and late life uh, possible methylation uh, rates um, and uh, that would be uh, something that you really can't get elsewhere uh, as well. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, they're stored, um, so I usually get this question, um, in formalin or formaldehyde. If they're stored in ethanol, uh, which some of the museums have done, well, we can't use them because it leaches all the lipid out. Um, and they're kind of all broken apart and cloudy. 
Um, fortunately, the Smithsonian and London have uh, stored these in formalin, uh, and they're basically kind of a pristine sample, and uh, we haven't had any problem whatsoever getting uh, any of these chemicals out uh, if they're stored like that. <clears throat> uh, this is just some bowhead work results. Uh, this was a 65-year-old female. Um, this is a, we were looking at um, kind of pregnancy interval type thing, cortisol, progesterone, and estradiol. And uh, our data sort of matches up with what they've um, seen uh, up in Barrow. Uh, this was the big earplug. It actually took me a whole year to delaminate this. It was absolutely a nightmare. But we got some pretty interesting data, and, uh, and the folks from Barrow are pretty, are pretty happy about this, um, showing potential uh, birth events here, uh, ranging from like 11 to 14, and depending on what peaks you count. We're still kind of uh, modeling through this and uh, figuring out uh, how to analyze this best. Um, and we have a, actually uh, a epigenetics person, or not, uh, uh, ooh, somebody knows how to model uh, epi, what's the word? Not epigenetics. Uh, come on, guys. Epi, who does all the, the epi? What you, I just always say epi, and I can't think of epi what? Uh, epidemiology. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so epidemiologists, so people that actually like, take these data and like make, you know, quantitatively or analytically uh, look at it to <clears throat> give you some indication of what's going on. So the epidemiologist working on that. Um, some of the isotopic data we got from the uh, bowhead um, helps kind of validate some of the aging issues that we might have with this animal. So when these animals migrate, they kind of do this weird thing back and forth between the uh, uh, Bering and the Chukchi and the Beaufort, and uh, they think there's some, uh, you know, some feeding and fasting thing going on. Uh, the lamina weren't as distinct, uh, so we were really kind of curious whether or not they're feeding all the time, um, and it was hard to um, figure it out. But we did see really nice uh, light and dark um, patterns of migration, especially for the uh, nitrogen. Um, and these animals, and that kind of helps us um, kind of validate the uh, age of these uh, animals in the lamina. We also tried some cesium-137 and lead-210 for aging validation. Didn't work. Uh, we think it was a kind of an analytical issue that our uh, instrumentation wasn't sensitive enough, and so we're kind of going to go back to the drawing board on this um, and see if we can uh, uh, get another plug uh, to work up. Uh, we were fairly confident this was going to work, and it, we had too much noise, and we just couldn't find a, a nice decay rate on this. <clears throat> so this type of work is uh, kind of gaining traction. We got a lot of like weir weird popular press on this, and I think if we come out with a paper showing that you know, World War II and or the whaling uh, has some impact on the stress of these animals, um, that's also going to generate some press. But, um, like I said, this was the uh, National Academy of Sciences came out with this last year, and they basically came out and said, uh, kind of singled out our stuff here, which is really nice. Uh, natural matrices that are laid down in semi-annual layers from birth to death are particularly promising. Uh, they even mentioned baleen and whale earplugs. So, that's really good when you're trying to get funding, right? I go to the funding agency and I'm like, hey, NAS says that this is really promising. Uh, please help, type of thing. So um, this, is, this is nice and it's really uh, kind of helpful. <clears throat> so, so what have we seen so far, right? Um, so we can do these really neat reconstructive profiles uh, from birth to death. Uh, in these animals. Gives us some baseline information, which is nice. Um, you know, we can use this to assess uh, population health or individual health. Um, and retrospective data is important, right? I mean, um, it's really nice to have like really current stuff, but going back to see uh, what created this stress to the animal or 
what happened with this population? Is there any indication that will give us some information that we could use for conservation issues moving forward, obviously? Um, positively correlated with industrial whaling. Um, pretty happy about that. We see these really nice slopes between Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, uh, 58 metals. We're analyzing that right now. Doing a lot of neat methodology stuff with ELISAs and dual mass spec and selected, selected pressurized liquid extraction. Um, and we have a little thing here showing that they match up really nicely as far as the dual mass spec and the ELISA kits. And I did the math back in the envelope, as they always say. It's about 100 bucks per lamina for us to do what we need to do. It costs about, I figure, about a gazillion dollars of ship time to do what uh, we've already looked at. Um, so, and pretty good. Really good for uh, kind of outreach. Uh, we just got that Sasha, and this is Charlie Potter from the Smithsonian. We just got a little uh, um, display or exhibit in the Smithsonian, which is really nice to go to funding agencies and say, hey, look, two million people a year get to see what we're doing. And this is just some of the jars of earplugs that they have wrapped in the hotel towels or napkins uh, in the Smithsonian. Um, and you can see some of them, like, you know, the formalin or formaldehyde is like, you know, dried out or it's starting to desiccate, but it soaks up on these things and keeps them nice and moist. And actually, these are better off for analyzing than uh, stuff that's been uh, covered forever. They're a little easier to work with. One of the other bonuses, I have to show this because of Perry, is you get to meet some kind of cool people. So there's uh, me and Emma Thompson. That's for you, Perry. <laughs> so that was pretty neat. She, she actually thought our research was kind of funny in kind of weird British humor way. <laughs> so I'd like to acknowledge uh, Sasha Yusenko. He's a co-PI in this. And together, we've been working on this for a few years. And, and we have a ton of work to do. Uh, and then everybody who's helped funding. This was funded by Office of Naval Research and the Marine Mammal Commission. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. So these are only from baleen whales, and no baleen whales in captivity, fortunately. Um, and as I was talking, when I was talking to the grass uh, students earlier, <coughs> um, I've, I've obtained samples from the SeaWorld before on like various projects, and uh, it's not fun. Um, there's a lot of paperwork involved, so I try to avoid our captive. And as Perry knows, I, I did, when I was working on my dissertation, I was at uh, the Alaska Sea Life Center for a couple of years. And uh, I learned a lot, um, but it was fairly a miserable experience, so. Do non-baleen whales have these earplugs? Yeah, we think sperm whales might. Uh, nobody's verified that. Somebody thinks that Kogia, which is, uh, kind of a smaller, kind of killer whale looking thing. Um, might have them, again, we don't know. Um, I've talked to people at Woods Hole who've done like the, the CAT scans. Uh, we went over today and looked at the, uh, the neat little, uh, little <laughs> veterinary medical uh, building. And they have this really great necropsy room and they have this, uh, you know, hoist coming out of this area, going to the freezer, and on the way the animal gets necropsied. Same sort of thing at Woods Hole, but they have it coming out of the freezer on the hoist, going to an MRI, right, where they just lay it down and they'll do all this. So I talked to the people that do that, and they said there's no evidence of uh, earplugs in some of the smaller cetaceans that they see. It's actually a different, it's a different mechanism. It actually looks different. It looks more like ours with the cochlea and everything. Is there any evidence of resorption in these earplugs during different times of starvation? Or? Yeah, I mean, you know, with the isotope stuff, we might be able to kind of get to that, but I doubt it. Like I said, these are six-month means, right? So, uh, you know, if we see big dips in the, in the nitrogen signature, it might be indicative of that, but it's, it's very difficult. 
uh, for us to get to that, you know, if they're really starving or not. Because, I mean, you think about this, I mean, if it's gonna starve to death, it's gonna die, right? So um, if it's really hungry, and we might see a dip, but you know, if the plug keeps going, then you know, we can, it's kind of a tricky one to tackle with this, yeah. Maybe you can help me just kind of put it all together. I mean, if you're, you know, you're doing so much and getting all of this valuable information, but at the same time, you know, we kind of already know that noise and other things cause stress to whales, and you're able to show that um, kind of that some of the analysis you've done reflect that it's a function of that stress in the environment in whales that are dead because you have to kill them to get the earplugs out, right? We don't have to kill them. They have well, to I die. Know, they have to be dead. Right. Yeah, don't them. say that too loudly. <laughs> so, so, you know, you, at the very end, you, you said, mentioned something about the research being used to uh, estimate the vital rates of whale populations in response to stress. Uh, so sort of not so much vital rates as, as response to stress. Now, like the calving intervals and things like that, we can, we can definitely look at how this could impact uh, recovery rates, right? Um, you know, there's going to be some sort of a, uh, you know, fecundity issue here. Like, if we see that the intervals are, you know, of what we perceive as pregnancies every, you know, 2.5 years or three years or whatever, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean there was a calf. So we have to kind of uh, figure out if there's some sort of uh, fecundity correction factor there, right? So that might be used for uh, um, some of the ecological questions. Now, as far as the stress, I mean, I think what you're asking is, like, so what? What can we do with this? Well, you're sort of right that we know that uh, noise stresses them out. We don't know to what extent. I mean, there's some evidence that we see um, in some of these studies that say, well, you know, ships go by and animals take off, or sonar hits them and they beat. Um, but we don't know if that's, an, you know, if that's a stressor that's from that or something else or, or whatever. I mean, so this is actually um, kind of a first shot at saying that, yes, we can see that there seems to be a correlation between um, whaling, and I don't even know what that, I don't even know what to call that, right? I mean, you have animals that are dead, but the live animals, right, show the stressor from that, right? So what does that mean, right? Does that mean that, like I said, are they communicating? Was it they're making noise? Was it the ship's making noise? Because this is, these are samples that were taken from all over the world. We got North Pacific, North Atlantic, you know? And so, but the fact that they're all kind of literally like, showing the same signal through their life during this period of time is really interesting, right? It's not just the North Atlantic whales were impacted or the Pacific whales were impacted, they were all impacted, right? So what is it about this whaling activity, right? This is just Northern Hemisphere, right? And there's still whaling going on in the Southern Hemisphere. So I can only imagine that, you know, somebody could get a hold of this and say, well, these animals are going to be all stressed out because there's, you know, the Japanese just killed 333 minke whales in the Southern Hemisphere this year, right? So does that mean that all the whales in the Southern Hemisphere are, are stressed out? Eh, maybe, right? I don't know. So I'm still trying to kind of like wrap my brain around what that mechanism is, right? What that communication is, these animals. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, 
we're, we're, what we're probably going to have to do is look at um, the individual animal, for instance, if there's like Pacific versus Atlantic and look at maybe uh, these, you know, progesterone spikes, right? See if there's any difference. Like if the, I mean, I think what you're asking is, is you know, do we, is there a, is there a contaminant burden that's going to elicit yes. some physiological response? Possibly, we haven't got to that point yet. So there's, there's more, there's so much in here, right, that needs to be kind of worked through. And I'm just literally showing you just, you know, what we've kind of come up with the last couple months, right? Um, I think in a year from now, we're gonna have a lot more. Um, but that's a great question, and I think it's possible to get some of those answers, but I can't off the top of my head say right now. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. So, what would you say then compared to just the feminine belly earplug? Yeah. So we, one of my students is actually doing a blubber baleen and earplug uh, from the same animals. So, uh, we have four or five samples, recent samples, where they got the, the baleen, uh, the blubber. Uh, to look at like total burden of contaminants and the earplug and to see how they match up. Um, we're really excited to see where that, that leads. Uh, especially that they're young and the baleen hasn't eroded away yet, so it'll probably be like a full picture of what's going on as well as with the earplug and see how it matches up. Um, that's uh, gonna be a chapter in her dissertation. She's starting that this summer, so it's a great question. Yeah? So you mentioned uh, when you're Yep. So what's the prediction there that they should have more mercury when they're eating from Well, we think it's going to change from mercury to methylmercury or vice versa. Yeah, so we, we're going to try to use that as like uh, kind of an indicator of like birth, basically, right? That it's going to switch. Now, we're going to be off six months or so, right? And there's actually, in the earplug itself, there's actually what they call a birth line, right? Which you can actually see it on fresh samples, but some of these preserved samples, you can't see it. Right, because they've, they're so old and they've gotten hard and, and uh, they've just kind of lost some of the coloration. Um, so we can't really see it. It's a real faint white line in the, in the earplug. So, it's like the yeah, it's like the very first. And, you know, it's really interesting. <laughs> it's really interesting that, uh, uh, um, oh, <laughs> on the bowhead, uh, this was typical barrel. If you ever, anybody ever worked at barrel before? Um, they give us this earplug, right? And they said, well, okay, the, here's, the, here's, the, here's the earplug. And we spent, I spent a year delaminating this thing and uh, came up with all these data and I went back to them. And I said, well, you know, we got this thing aged at, at 65 years old, right? And the guy that gave me the plug says, oh, well, we didn't give you the whole plug, we forgot. <laughs> So, yeah, that was about the same noise I made, <laughs> except I probably swore or something. So. No other questions? All right, thanks. Thank you.